like everything I do, it's ugly as hell, but it should work. Hey folks, how you going? Today, we are looking at the DIY solder reflow plate. So, yes, you've probably seen this on Great Scott. Uh, this is a slightly different version though, and I'll show you why in a minute. But, first of all, I've got a blank. I actually got about five of these and gave some to some mates because I only need one or two. But thank you to After Earth on GitHub who actually came up with this product. It's really, really good. And then thank Von Ryan and Bre uh, Von Ryan123 and Bretsky74 on GitHub who worked on the version 3 code. As you can see, it says version 3 here, and that's because it doesn't use the 328P, it uses a 4809. Is it 4809? Yeah, 4809. Um, so this is a slightly different variant that uses a different chip and possibly has some different capabilities. But the irony of this is in a previous video, I actually made a UPDI programmer and this is using an, uh, an Arduino Nano, which has a 328P on it. Actually, this one has a 168, which probably would have worked too. But, you know, ironically, this was made because of a shortage of 328s and then I made one and programmed it with a 328. So... Uh, I did find this on Great Scott, but I'd wanted something like this for a long time anyway because I have been doing a little, a uh, fair bit of SMD soldering, a little bit of kind of prototyping on the side. So this worked out really well. What I have learned though is don't try to boil water on it. I put water in a metal cap and cook the MOSFET. So I had to order some spare MOSFETs just in case that happens again. Um, you can also see I've made a bit of a change on this one. I tried something experimental here. I've got this USB-C power delivery board uh, and you can... Uh, kind of open up those two little pins to the right there. I wonder if I can get nice and... Oh, that's kind of in the shadow, isn't it? That doesn't work. Yeah, so you can just kind of see those two little pins on the right in there. Uh, and then this will deliver 15 volts. And it works, but it cuts out because this can't do the amps. This is limited to, I think, three amps, and I need at least five. Um, so what we'll do first is we'll look at how I've got this assembled. And what I did here was ordered it from an online manufacturer with almost all of the SMD components already on there because it made it easier. The through-hole components are the more expensive ones to have them do. So I just said, don't worry about those, I'll do them myself. But when I was modifying the bomb file, I accidentally deleted R2 as well. So we'll have to solder him on, but that's nice and easy. Uh, I'll put the bomb file with R2 added back on uh, in the links below so that you can order this variant if you want and I'll also put links to a few other things if need be like this USB-C power delivery module which has been very handy for some other projects. So the only thing I didn't get soldered on was the 4809. Now the reason for that is they quoted me about $7 per unit and I got them for about $2 per unit instead. Um, I'm not sure why it's so expensive but that looks like it's the LCSC pricing and for once Mouser was actually cheaper and I got them from Mouser for two or three bucks each. Overall, getting the five of these with most of the components already on there was about 80 bucks, uh, including without a solder plate, which I regret, this is for something different. Um, with a mask plate, it would have made this bit a little bit easier, but I'm gonna show you how I did that anyway. And then you also need an LED screen. And got one somewhere, but that was about 10 bucks on eBay. So one of these little ones here, um, you can get them pre-assembled like that and you just sort them straight in. So I, I'll put a link to that eBay or Amazon or something below. Alrighty, that was absolutely infuriating and I just had to dig through 20 odd mouse for an LCSC orders to find the bag that I'd put it incorrectly back in. So that's it there and it's just got four pins on the back which is your I squared C or I2C, whatever you want to call it. I'm not going to solder it directly in though, I'm actually going to use make it removable using these headers uh, because the chip's underneath or you might want to do diagnostics and this one that I already put together, that was the one downfall so far so I'm going to fix that. What's also really important to be aware of is because I didn't get the exact buttons that he recommended, I got these other ones, they operate differently depending on whether you put them in one way or the other way so I've got to make sure I put them in the right way uh, because they contact either on the down or the up and it took me a long time to figure it out with this one I could not get it to work so let's get it soldered together what we've got I'll do the chip last and that's because I want to show you exactly what I'm doing but what we have here if I can get it to focus again is the DC barrel jack the temperature sensor the two buttons the one kilo ohm R2 that I'm missing 
those pins that I'm going to put on and oh, somehow I've got a spare pin there uh, and then that which will be a removal. Montage time! <coughs> don't breathe that stuff but uh, make sure if you're using really cheap crap solder like this that you don't have any connections that are touching because it is sometimes a little bit lumpy and doesn't quite wet smoothly so I always double check that lumpy unwetting solder. I'm using it in boost mode here as well just to get a bit more heat out of it. Uh, these pins do soak up a bit of heat. Now this temperature sensor, you want to get as close to the board as possible. So I'm actually going to clamp it as when I put the first solder joint on to make sure that it is really there. And once I've set that first pin, we should be right. And again, always remember to check your pins because uh, if I leave it in the edit, you might have seen I put a bit too much on here and I joined two pins, but it came out good in the end. So I'm going to put this little resistor on. I'll just do that manually soldering it. I'm not going to bother with the SMD for that. You can see that this display fits nicely in there and it's away from the heat, which is good, but removable is mainly what I'm after. And then we're going to get onto this bad boy. Alright, not the best job because you should be doing it with a you know, reflow station, but it's on there. So now for this last bit, or well, for this next step, what I'm actually going to do is get my chip quick solder and dab a spot on each of these pins. Now you only need about seven of these pins, but a lot of them may be ground. Alright, so I think that's enough. Now, it's, it's not pretty far far from it but it doesn't have to be one of the great advantages uh, one of the great things about SMD soldering is you don't always have to be super accurate a lot of that is going to evaporate it's going to cling to anything metallic I did struggle to actually get it to even stick to the pins there I think my chip quick's getting a little bit old so I'll order another jar but what I'm going to do now is position this chip on there this 4809 and hit it with that heat gun here which I'll bring across and just let it melt and it should set. We'll have a close look after that to make sure that it has set correctly, but I don't foresee any issues. All right, that looks lined up right to me. So let's blast it with the heat gun. Got my heat gun set to 350C. As you can see, all the chip quick is falling up and adhering to those pins. Let's have a closer look at how that went. So we do have a few joint pins there. You might be able to see them. All I'm going to do is any that are actually connected to the PCB, I'm just going to separate them with my knife. Uh, you can also just touch them a bit with the soldering iron, that can do it too, but most of those don't matter if they're actually shorted, so I will just touch up those few that we need. Alright, so all you more experienced soldering enthusiasts were probably blowing your lids then about how much excess I had. But it cleans up alright. Just use a uh, 
bit of flux and a bit of goot wick and took the excess away and that looks very nicely soldered to me now. Uh, yep, I don't see any issues with that. So the next step, we're going to stick three header pins on here, which is, if you can see, on here, which is the UPDI slot. If I have any header pins. Make it three yellow ones. There we go. And we'll up upload some code to this. I'll put a link to the GitHub repo below as well because it's not the After Earth one. There's no V3 code there at the time of writing. This is another repo that, um, you know, those two people I mentioned before, what were their names? I've got it here. Uh, Von Ryan123 and Bretsky74 put together. Now, in their variant as well, can I get that to line up right? In their variant, they do actually allow it to go up to 220 degrees. You'll see that in the code. I'm not sure if that's actually a good idea or how well it handles that, especially because I'm not using all the exact parts from the bill of materials. So if you have any experience with that or you've tried it, let me know. I'm not gonna do it. I'm just gonna sit here and struggle to solder this thing. All right, like everything I do, it's ugly as hell, but it should work. So we're gonna move over to the computer now. I'll give this a quick tidy up and then we'll flash it with some code and see if she runs. Right. So over on the computer, because I can't be bothered screen recording, we're using the Bretsky 74 repo because he actually has the version three, uh, hardware version three code. He's forked that from Von Ryan, who did the original code, added a bit more stuff and that's a fork of the original which doesn't have the code because he hasn't updated it in over a year now. So if we download that, Save into a folder, open it up in the legacy Arduino IDE. I'm using the legacy one because I actually find it a fair bit faster. You can see here, there are a few things that are need, a few things that are needed. So first of all, Mega Core X by MCU Dude, who I've mentioned before. You just copy and paste this JSON file and under preferences, stick it in your additional board manager URLs here. And you can also click that little button if you've got a couple. And then in your boards manager, you want to make sure you've got it installed, which I have now. You also need a few libraries. Now these, you search for each of them under Manage Libraries and install them. This Manage Libraries thing is actually getting quite big and it is really slow on this terrible internet I have out here. Once you've installed those three libraries, you should pretty much be good to go. So all you have to do then is pick these settings. So the board is the 4809. Leave those all as default. We want to pick our JTAG programmer here and then we're gonna to need to specify the port. So I've got this one that I made in a previous video. If you wanna check it out, there will be a card about here, if I remember, or a link below. We plug this one in, it should pop up as COM5 on this computer. Yep. And then we plug it in to the board. Now on the board here, it goes five volt data ground, and it says it just above, and I know my five volt is my purple one here. So if we plug that in, haven't got the display on there yet, we should theoretically be able to compile this and send it to the AT4809. Now, anyone with a very, very keen eye might notice that I did actually resolder this chip. I just used the heat gun to remove it and then cleaned it up slightly and put it back down because I had a short that I just couldn't get rid of. Um, I don't know what happened. It looked perfectly fine, as you saw, but it was not. Now, theoretically, we put this screen in and then power cycle it, it should boot our code. Look at that. Isn't that bloody sexy? Now, of course, it's not going to work with this amount of current. We're going to have to plug it in with a jack and try it out. So let's give it a, a sec. I'll grab a power supply for it. You want 50, uh, 12 to 18 volts. I usually use 15, but it also needs a lot of current. This thing will draw about five amps, so make sure you do have a hefty power supply for it. Let's go grab one. So my dopey brain says, let's go grab one, and I was going to fish one out of a bucket when I forgot I've got this thing sitting right here. I got this from AliExpress, I think, not Amazon. I'll put a link if I can find it. Um, it's actually excellent. I went reading a lot of reviews of those cheapo power supplies. This one does um, 300 watts from memory up to 60 volt. And that's pretty much exactly what I need. It does constant voltage and constant current. And it's got a USB port. It's actually grounded. It seems to work a treat. So I'm going to plug this in and see if it does what we want. I'll grab my heat gun too to keep an eye on it. So the way this works then, if we have a look up close and get it in focus, 
You pretty much have these up buttons and down buttons, they both work, that's controlling your temperature. And then you hit them both together to begin cooking. Let's do it. Now, my other one makes like a capacitor squeal. I think the PWM frequency is audible or some of the components vibrate. Let's see. Now, that fails if one of the buttons is the wrong way around. It is drawing... Not much. So, I'm going to guess the output pin that goes to the MOSFET isn't attached properly. Let's have a look at that. Alright, so I did just have two minor issues with it. One was my R2 wasn't actually attached properly, which was my bad. That's why it's really handy to remove this. Um, but also, there must have been just one pin. I just touched all the pins with the soldering iron slightly and uh, wet them again. They look good now. So, we plug this in. You know if R2 is not working, I believe, uh, because the current or the voltage will be wrong. So, get that out of the way so you can see a little bit better. And we'll do the same thing. This time, you'll actually hear it squeal. There we go. So you can see it's drawing 73, 74 watts. And uh, definitely heating up. So over here, this sensor is picking up around 50 degrees. It says 80 on here. So it is going to be um, averaging. There's definitely some cool spots on here too. It looks like towards the bottom of the board is actually quite cool. Um, up the top is the hot bit. So we've set it to 180. See how hot it gets. Let's use kind of near the middle. The software might need a bit of tweaking or some calibration. That's definitely going over 180 at some points. And it's still quite cool along the bottom. So you will want to use more the middle and top half of this. This could also probably be negated by putting a bit of thermal mass under the bottom. I also may be misunderstanding uh, how it heats it. So 180 might be, I don't know, not necessarily the peak, but like where it spends most of its time. So this thing is right, and it looks so because it's about 30 degrees in here. Then uh, this thing at the top is way over that temperature. At the temperature sensor, it's about 30 degrees under. And at the bottom, it is quite cold. I'd love to see this on a FLIR camera, but I just don't have one. You can see here, it's getting hot enough that it's about to turn off. So we'll grab its temperature again once it does. There we go. It's in the cooling down stage, and it got up to about 230, I'd say, along the top, and barely touched 60 along the bottom. Kind of the middle was around that 180-ish. So the middle does get where it says it needs to get. We're going to take this off and put it to the side. That is toasty because we actually have something to test it with. What I've got here is a very small little module that I've been working on. I'll release a video about this first design slightly, but I've got an ESP32C3 that I want to stick on here. That is what this stencil is underneath. So, oh, there's a bit of the heat that's been absorbed. Line this up now. There we go. And we'll scrape some paste onto it. For that, I'm just going to use the lid. And scrape the excess off with my little ruler here. This is an awesome ruler, by the way. 10 out of 10, would recommend. I'll put a link for it down below if I remember. But excellent for sizing things. And occasionally, that is the last thing that you want to happen. Yeah, I'd say that's close enough. So now, we'll test it out by putting this espressive chip on this little riser board I've been working on. Uh, I'm going to make a video about these two videos actually. One about how I made this first revision, which we have a look in here. I've got a couple of, and they work a treat. So, 
There's the back of it with my little logo, and there's the front with the module attached. I'm going to be using these for a few things in the future. Uh, I will make a second video though of the new variant because there's a few things in this design process that I realised I could improve on. But for now, it gives us an opportunity to test out our new toy. Put this down and see if we can't line this up perfectly. Ha, ah, focusing would be great, wouldn't it? Yeah, that's probably a lot better for you. Oh, and I just smudged it. Ah, oh, that's all right. We drop that right in the center. Put this on top. Get as close to perfect as we can. Then I'm gonna plug it back in, run it again, and I'll get some nice close up footage on my phone as well. Let's do this. Uh, it's getting pretty hot now. It says it's around 120. In the middle, it's up around 140, 130, 140. So that should melt the chip quick any moment. It just has to get through 1.6 mil of FR4 PCB first, which might take a hot minute, literally. And there it goes. Look at that, just settle nicely into place. <laughs> the power supply needed to chuck its fan on, but that settled into place perfectly pretty much as it hit 180 degrees, which you all saw. Um, that worked better than I expected. I have to give it some credit there. So, let that cool down for a minute before I pick it up. That looks like it worked. Um, this whole thing probably cost me $20, $30 to make. Behind my hiccups. It was also a lot of fun and a good learning experience. You don't have to use this JTAG to UPDI. You can also uh, do the serial UPDI. I prefer having this available just for bespoke reasons. Um, I'm going to use this a lot. I'm going to use this one a lot as well. I just put some little standoffs on the bottom there. Um, they're from a motherboard box I think, just spare that I had, and this one I have actually soldered that on firm, and you can yeah leave it soldered on once you're happy with it, or you can just have it in the headers like I have. Both are great options, I think the original idea by After Earth is fantastic. If you'd just like to buy this as a product, let me know, because I don't mind you know knocking out a dozen or so of them and selling them on my website. I will also be selling these ESP32 C3 risers at some point, but you'll find out more about that in the video. For now, it did what it needed to do. Hope you enjoyed that video. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you want to see more like this because I do enjoy making it and I think these sorts of DIY options are game changing. It's just what we should be doing more of and what we should see more of. I'd love it if someone could uh, make it USB-C instead of a barrel jack. That would be great because power delivery can obviously do that. And it would be great if um, there was a few things compensated for like the uneven heat. There's probably a better way to measure the heat than that. You might be able to measure the resistance and probably need to take into account ambient temperature. But thank you to everyone that contributed to this. Thank you to you viewers for supporting it. No thank you to YouTube. I don't want to be part of their program that monetizes. Till next time, take it easy, enjoy your weekend.